Hello and welcome to another installment of And Now for Something Completely Machinima. I am Damien Valentine and this time I'm going to be joined by Alex, who is the director of the film we recently reviewed, Star Wars Fallen Angel. So um, please talk a little bit about yourself and the film. Hi. Um, yes, I'm, I'm Alex. I work on a few Unreal shorts here and here and there, particularly for Star Wars stuff because... Star Wars in it. It's fun. <laughs> um, and yeah, so we worked on a short recently called Fallen Angel, which was for a competition that was run by a guy called Cinematic Captures, who is another um, content creator who creates uh, Unreal Cine- Unreal Engine cinematics. Um, so it was a competition he put on. And yeah, we entered it in the best film category and created it for that over a couple of months. And we, we never won best animated film for it. And it was a uh, it was really, it was really cool. Actually, there were a lot of really, really, really good submissions to that competition. It was really good. Um, yes, yeah, so that's just kind of what I do. Um, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> that's how we um, we discovered your film because one of our earlier podcasts last year we covered the contest because we thought people might want to um, submit. And then, of course, when the- mm the uh, winners were announced we saw yours and uh, really liked it so and we were really impressed by it thank you very much so uh, what inspired the story for the film um i can actually send it to you let remind me to send this to you after this um okay. it was actually a bit of artwork um that we found and apologies to the guy who made it i can't rem- remember your name off the top of my head but i will send this around and um, yeah, it was basically just this um, still of Vader stood over Padme's grave. And this was before, the, the, it wasn't a comic, but it was before that was uh, released, I think. It was a couple of years ago now. And um, yeah, I saw that and was just like, I want to create something that would justify remaking this in Unreal. So that's where the first iteration of Fallen Angel came from. Um, and it was the kind of thing that I started a while ago and it was just kind of put on the back burner just for other commitments and stuff. And then like, when the competition came around, originally we were going to enter something else and uh, a friend of mine's an animator, James, he, um, I asked him, I cheekily asked him if he'd be up for helping out and I sent him the cut of it and he was just like, uh, there's not much story here. And you know what? There wasn't much story. It was it was rubbish. Uh, it was really pretty, but there wasn't much substance to it. There was no emotion. Right. So at that point, we just kind of, I just kind of said to him, I've got this other idea I've been playing around with of Vader visiting Padme's grave, which I was kind of avoiding doing because the big thing it needed was um, basically high quality face animation to really sell the emotion. And it's really, really difficult to do that when you can't see someone's face. You can do it. It's just really hard. And it's not, it doesn't end up quite as good, in my opinion. So that, that's kind of why we ended up doing that. So it wasn't originally going to be that for what for when we were going to do it. Um, but yeah, it, it, was, it was way, way better in the end. I've still not actually finished the other one that we scrapped. Um, I say scrapped, it's been... It's being in the process of being redone to be a bit better, uh, but I don't know when I'm going to do that. Um, I'm quite busy, but it'll oh, be fine. Well, I was going to say, if you, when you do eventually uh, finish it, or we'll be looking out for it because it, we're really impressed by this film. So, seeing more of what you can do would be a, a good thing. And one of the things that we, you're right about the there's a very emotional story. One of the things that stood out to us was there's not a single word of dialogue in the entire film, and that. To be able to pull that off is also quite a challenge because a lot of times you do need the dialogue. But I think this time it works perfectly without it. I think maybe dialogue would have made it less effective. Um, may I think for the yeah, I think maybe it would have. I think you can tell you can probably tell most of your story visually. Uh, and not have to rely on on dialogue unless there's, you know, something. Well, there's a lot of times you need dialogue, but this probably, like you said, this probably wasn't one of them. Um, 
I, I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where I'm, I'm not sure where I'm going with this. I had. <laughs> I knew I was going to answer this in my head. I was like, I'll go here, and I've totally forgotten. Um, but yeah, this this just did this just didn't need it. Um, and we were very lucky in that um, we were able to tell it through the expressions because, um, like I mentioned before, my friend James was helping me out, and he actually has an, um, a friend who's also an animator who does a lot of face work um and he's just like hey can i bring my mate on board i was like yeah yes please more help is good um because it was a you know two month time a two a two month turnaround is not a lot of time um so we needed all the help we could get and um yeah he just absolutely nailed it and um cool thing about it is and um is something that sometimes isn't really thought about. Um, or it might it might be thought about. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, what you often see, I think, with a lot of videos, is that they'll put on a. I've actually got one there. They'll stick on a motion capture suit, and then the data they get from that will probably be what they get. It's the same with uh, face animation. You'll record like I am right now to a camera. I can record this dialogue, and a lot of the time, not so much in um, bigger things, but maybe in like hobby projects and stuff, people just learning it, they'll um, they'll probably just use the raw data. And a lot of the time that isn't quite what you want, or it be the raw data with a bit of cleanup. But really, where we spent all of our time was on refining that animation so that we could tell the story through a character's actions and their expressions. And... Um, yeah, like I said, I'm not totally, I'm just kind of rambling at this point, but, (laughs) um, but that's why we could do it without dialogues because we really put the time into cleaning up all that animation. And from the get go, we had it planned out, uh, every single, well, almost every single shot, pretty much every shot through the entire thing, all the shots with characters, we had it planned out from the get go, what they were going to be how long they were going to be and what we wanted to show with that. So every shot in that piece has a purpose. Cause another thing as well, we had a three minute time limit, which is also not a lot of time. Um, (laughs) And basically we have to take the story and condense it down. And I got it to two minutes, 59 seconds. So I'm happy with that. Just in time, just (laughs) just the right length. Just in the, yeah, we've got it just under because I reduced the shot by a, half a second here and half a second there right. and my mate uh, alex um had to do a little bit of recomposing just to fix it because he created the score for it as well um but yeah so that, that was a big thing that we could do with it as well we had it planned and we knew what we were going to do so we could really decide where because time management's a huge thing as well we could really decide where we were going to focus our efforts and where our big emotional beats were and also, for example, there's that shot with um, where the Rebels first re- realize who Vader is, you know, with the lightning and the silhouette of Vader. Yeah. That was actually, animation-wise, qu- a very low-effort shot compared to some of the others, but it still had one of the bigger impacts, I think, throughout the entire thing. Um, so it's just kind of identifying where we need to put the work. And there were a couple of places where we, um, you know, we cut, we cut corners a little bit and use some stock animation that we had and made it work on the rig and stuff. Um, I think I answered your question, but if you want to make a shot without dialogue, plan it, yeah. plan everything. I think you really have to. Um, it's, it is uh, such a tricky thing to, to pull off. And I think you guys succeeded uh, fantastically. So um, my next question is, why do you choose Unreal as your rendering platform? Because it's it's just really really good, <laughs> and it's it's um and it's free, you know, which is it's actually nuts how much high quality content that Epic put out for free. You've got un we got Unreal, which is at, at this point a world probably a world leading toolkit for like real-time production in general you know we've seen um probably since the mandalorian is probably when it started to really take off 
but you're seeing the big push for virtual production and things like that, um, which is very similar to cinematics. Is you know it's using the same tool set almost, uh, as far as I'm as far as I'm aware. But you can you can take a camera and track it with um, optical markers or even the HTC Vive, which is a similar thing, and you've got a camera in 3D space that you can control, which I really want, but I, I'm too cheap to afford that, so I'll just kind of make a camera. Um, and uh, but that, that's why we chose it. It's, it was also something that I've used in the past, um, doing like other hobby projects and stuff. So I was quite familiar with it, and I was working in it already. I, I was planning on doing um, my own short films and stuff. Anyway, I've been like I mentioned before, I've been working on them for a while. Um, so every all everything we needed was mostly already set up. It was just a case of constructing a story in it in quite a condensed time frame so we were very lucky in that and most of the stuff we needed to do with regards to prep was was already done um another reason to use unreal is now metahuman of course yeah that that's free what it's crazy um it, it, it just i don't know it's just awesome it's some really really cool kit really cool um but yeah that that's that's it in a nutshell so if i were to use unity for example i'd be a lot more limited just because of um well two other engines uh, two other game engines i'm familiar with are lumberyard and cryengine from years and years ago producing a film called letters from vega and um yeah they're, they're quite different if i want to do custom stuff with shaders for example i need to learn how to code it and that's just something I just don't know how to do. It's not on my radar for a bit. No, it makes sense. You have to use the platform that best suits you and what you've got available to you. Um, but yeah, Unreal is very impressive. We've been covering various films with it. and Personally, I, I feel like yours is the best example we've seen so far of what you can do uh, with the Unreal um, engine. I mean, we've seen some others, but it's just so much detail. Even the, the raindrops hitting the ground when they're outside and all the, yeah. the details and everything like that. It's uh, there's so much attention to detail went into your film. It really shows off the full potential of the, uh, the engine. Uh, oh man of the full, it, it doesn't even come close to the full potential <laughs> of that engine. It, it's, it's, I'm still learning it. It's, it's nuts. Um, and just on those raindrops as well to get those done, I literally followed a, and that's another great thing about Unreal is that there is a tutorial for everything. Um, and you just mentioned those raindrops. To get those working, I followed a tutorial to the letter to right. get that working. That was None of that was me. I was okay. just almost copy-pasting and reapplying what I learned somewhere else. Um, so that that's, an, that's another great thing about it is just the size of the... Because I'd say partially because it's free, it's very, very accessible. And... From that, you get a wide breadth of tutorials for almost anything you need, and there's paid courses as well. And the paid course, a lot of the paid courses are really, really good. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's it's just it's just crazy. Um, I keep saying crazy. I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. I mean, this is really interesting. It's um, I, I work on a lot of Star Wars animation myself, so I saw your video. I was feeling like I need to, to up my game a little bit. And so being able to talk to you has actually given me some ideas of things I need to, to look at uh, myself. Um, so, yeah, um, talk to us about your work process for working on this. Like, how did you, where did you begin and what was the okay. process all the way through? Um, <clears throat> so, it start, so it starts with, a, like I tell, it starts with a script, right? right. So getting down pen, pen to paper or keyboard to screen and figuring out what you're going to do. Um, right. So in this case, it was... Um, cause again, it was based on that artwork. So I started off with thinking, okay, how am I going to, how am I going to justify this? What's the story here? What are the, what are the emotional beats that we want to hit? So obviously we want to show Vader sad, but we want to, so this is kind of like the creative intent behind it. So we like to play with Vader's light and dark side a bit and really contrast the two. And by the end, basically we want to start off with, although it looks like Darth Vader, it's not, it's Anakin, right? Yeah. So at the start we're starting off with Anakin and we're by the end of it we've killed off that look or we've attempted to kill off that little sliver of Anakin that's showing through in this film 
by the end of it and that's all and then it's gone and we, so that's what the intention was so it starts off with a script and that is just describing okay the set of the scene and let's figure out in words what we're going to do um so um yeah so we basically do basically do that so establish our story beats anakin gets to Padme, uh, Padme's grave how do we show a bit of respect for that we have him clear the leaves off it to keep it tidy show, showing a bit of respect for her um, and then he takes an emotional moment and then about halfway through he gets disturbed by um, we just went with rebels because that, those were the assets we had we would have loved to use like Naboo guards or something like that but unfortunately time is was against us and we just used what we had and then we get that. Then we start to introduce Darth. We, well, we use the rebels approaching it to introduce the Darth Vader side of it, and literally show visually his st- his changing emotion by having the lighting get darker and stuff, and just very bluntly say, "It's changing now." Here's all the lighting changing and stuff. Which, yeah, I was really pleased with. That. I thought it looked really cool. I was you, really get, happy you get a feel. It. You get a real feel for his rage that his private moments been interrupted by these rebels that are mm. sneaking up behind him and he's just absolutely furious that yeah. they dare to <laughs> intrude and then um and yeah it was just almost beat for beat like so in the script i just write down the rebels approach him and then as the lighting gets darker they grow concerned and stop a, a bit confused on what's going on and then i actually had it in the script lightning reveal reveals the outline of the silhouette of of vader and then they realize who he is, realize they fucked up, and then they start. <laughs> then they start to back away. And mm-hmm. just as they get past the threshold of her her tomb, Vader holds them in place, right? So they can't back away. And then, through basically his vengeance, he he kills them because that's that's his dark side taking over, the anger side taking over. It might not be totally lore accurate to what would happen, but. It was just, it was for the purposes of telling a story, we we were a bit creatively free, if you like. Yeah. Um, and then that's basically it. The, the original version of the script was a lot more brutal. We had him, um, so this also ties a bit. So the first version of the script is kind of a blue sky. This is what we want to do if we had no budget kind of, well, if we had no budget considerations, right? Right. Um, so the original version had him killing off the other two rebels as he would otherwise. But then as he's approaching the final rebel, the rebel would take, this is in the first version, he'd take one shot, he'd deflect it back into his knee and knock him down, take another shot, deflect it back into the other knee, and then he's kind of on his knees and stuff. And third one would probably hit his shoulder so he can't fire his weapon anymore, so he's there helpless. And then Vader would basically make him suffer for a bit. Hmm. And so he doesn't just want to kill this guy, he wants to make him suffer like he's suffering right now. Right. And... So that's kind of what we went. That's kind of what the original version of it was, and we, you know, we'd have some cool visuals of him like towering over this defenseless soldier and stuff. Um, you know, bringing just basically trying to visualize Vader as a powerful figure. Essentially, I don't know how this would have looked exactly because I never made it, but that's what the intent was. But then I, you know, we sat down. Well, I sat down with James to figure out the um, the logistics of it. And then we cut it down based on that because um, one thing we're both very familiar with is budgeting our projects to figure out where we need to put our time and how long it's going to take. Um, so we were able to kind of, um, of, of all of it, all of it was pretty much the same apart from that that bit, that combat sequence was really trimmed down um, to essentially just be um, the rebels are killed, as you saw in the film. And then as you saw in the film, he screams at Vader like the idea being that it's his, I guess his dark side, if that makes sense. So Vader's not only, he's basically killing his friends to bring the dark side out in him, even though he's not force sensitive, but for the purposes of storytelling, that's what we were going for. And, you know, it tries to shoot him in anger because he doesn't know what, you know, he knows he's dead. So we might as well, might as well take it out on him. Um, And then, yeah, we ended up with what you saw in the film. Um, So that's kind of, in a long-winded way that's how we scripted it um (laughs) and then from that it's just going through and kind of visualizing it so we'll create what's called a shot list where you basically go through and kind of picture in your head for when you're reading the script how it's going to look 
Um, and from that, you generate a list of shots and then you just list down like, I don't know. Um, let's say the opening shot is a big wide of feed on the boo. We want to establish that with, more importantly, we want to establish that so that we don't need text because I hate text. Um, and, you know, what are the key, apart from the palace, what are the key um, uh, features of Naboo and things like that? And But for a shot list, we're just saying wide Naboo. Um, and then, you know, medium wide fader, blah, 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 blah. And that's, that's what we use as our basis for planning. So we can look at it and we now have a list we can associate with what we need to do. And um, from there, you produce an animatic, you get a sense of the timings. It's just using text. Um, and if we had time, I would have actually drawn up storyboards as well, just on a bit of paper, just drawing them up. And then we can actually see a visual of how it's going to look before we do it. Instead, what I did was I went into Unreal Engine and I just took stills. I had a couple of characters and I just took stills of where they're going to be to get an idea for the visuals that way. Makes sense. Way faster. Yeah. Um, they were enjoying storyboards and then so that's your animatic right uh so so like your first version of it and that's when you start to really see the visuals start to appear and then after that you're going into um quite often what i do is i'll actually block out the shots so the way our workflow worked is there's kind of two ways you can approach it you can have you can have it broken down by scene. So you have one long take for each character, right? And they all line up. And then you can cut between cameras and stuff as you want to in Unreal. Because at the time, because we did record mocap for it, we only had the one suit. And obviously we've got multiple characters interacting. So the way you can approach it that way is you record all your mocap and you trim it down based on the shot. So that's the next thing we did is we worked out how does this break down by scene? And then it within each of those scenes, how does it break down by shot and how we're going to... So basically for our mocap is I would record a full take of the mocap for each of those little scenes. So an example being that segment between... Um, yeah, it would be the segment between the Vader reveal halfway through with the lightning through the window up until they're frozen in place and they've been knocked to the ground. So just before they get knocked to the ground. So that was all one mocap take uh, for the Rebels. But because it was split up into different shots, we were quite flexible in how we use that data. So although the timing of the actual mocap recording, if you were to use it as one long thing, is set, because it's different shots, we can just slide it a little bit and just reuse the same bit twice here or there very slightly or skip bits altogether. And that lets you get a lot more out of a single take. Um, if you plan it like that, it takes, it's a bit more work, but you can do it. And so we did that through the whole thing. And what that lets us do is, for example, there's that scene where, you know, they just hold the shot where they just holding up the rebel by his neck. So that's two characters directly interacting, but I'm only one person recording the mocap. So what I could do is just have Vader like that and just doing some, you know, movement like that is if he's you know it's the rebel rebel struggling and he's reacting yeah. and then i can have the rebel just kind of hitting it punching him in the face or just or and giving up and things like that and getting stabbed and that kind of thing and then we can take those slivers trim them down based on the shot and what we want in the shot then throw it in and that's kind of all planned out before we shoot the mark at what we're going to do and then we record then we have some things it's like oh these will be nice to do and we'll record those as well and keep them in the in the bank um, we'll also not just record mark out, we'll find out where we can cut corners and just get stuff out of a library somewhere. For example, a walks the walk cycle at the start, we just grab that out of a library. And the shot where the rebels shoot Vader and Vader's deflecting it, that was actually taken from Jedi Fallen Order. Yeah. And we actually did some hand key over the top for the movements because it's actually a Vader walk cycle. So we brought the arm up and did that. Um so it's an example of where we can cut corners. And we, we did the same thing with the face as well. So the face was all recorded based on that, that scene length. Even It was recorded separately, though. And then that would all be cleaned up. And then from there, it's a case of getting it in the shot, building out the shots. And just what we could do, where we had it set up, was 
James and Jordan would work on the animation side of things. And basically we'd go through a phase of prep where they'd work on it. I'd export it into Unreal and it would just slot right into the shot. And then I can see an update there and then hit render, throw it into an edit, and then they can see their updates and shot. The only downside is when I'm doing that, I was also meant to be lighting. So we had to kind of budget our time there a little bit. Right. Um, Cause that's another thing as well is I'm actually releasing a tutorial about this today. Um, but it's not self plug. Um, what we'll do is uh, in, when this uh, goes out, the, the show notes underneath, we'll put the link to your tutorial underneath as well. Oh. So uh, uh, people can see it. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so basically, like, what I'll do is I'll light it per shot on a per shot basis. So lighting for shot 10, lighting for shot 20, 30, 40, 50 would all be in, like, a separate, what the, what they're called levels. So they'd be in a separate one, and then it just splits everything off and makes it super easy to light. I say super easy, it's it's still hard, but it's easier. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'd be doing all that and buying some VFX packs and stuff be, because it's way easier to use something high quality someone else made than make my own for a few quid. And that's another good thing about Unreal is the marketplace is amazing. Um, it's really easy to use. Um, yeah, and it's, from there, it's just refining it and nailing it down. And once we're happy with, and we'll tweak the edit a bit as well. And, and once once we're happy with it, oh, that's another thing I didn't mention. In the animatic, we actually just grabbed some music from star wars that was from a, the similar scene in revenge of the sith and um use that as temp audio uh just to kind of get an idea for pacing and stuff because you really you really want that in there because it does it does help a lot and help inspire people um working on it and what we did uh once we were happy with the animatic is uh alex who's the composer that worked on it and a good friend of mine he um he started working on the music and then we started getting that in there as well towards the end of it and literally within the last last week or so, that's when it all really started coming together and it came down right to the wire. And once we were happy with the visuals and it's just a case of lighting tweaks or small animation fixes, um, that's where my friend uh, Hybrid, he is an audio designer. And he, well, he was the audio designer on this project and he took the edit and started creating the Foley and audio tracks and then on the last day i think we, yeah i remember we had to submit it on the saturday night on the friday night i'd finished work and i pulled an all-nighter um to get it to get it all done that opening shot i made the night before overnight within a few hours be, like fueled on red bull i was just like right i gotta get this done i hadn't even started it by that point um like i did i did want to record a time lapse for it but obs broke and i was like right oh, i'm not bothering with that i need to get this done yeah, which would have been really cool because it, it did come together really well, really well. It started with nothing, um, and uh, yeah, so you did the final mix on it, and that's when like audio gets overlooked a lot um, for for films. I think you know part of it might just be the artists that work on it, including myself. You know, I'm, I'm guilty of it. You don't really think about it, but if you can really spend some good quality time working on the audio it makes a world of difference that that's basically our process in a nutshell so as you probably gathered a lot of time was spent on the prep um yeah. a lot a lot of time and that that makes the rest of it that much simpler uh to do and you can really yeah figure out what you're doing but yes that's, yeah. that's how we that's how we made it <laughs> the planning is definitely uh time well spent because otherwise you can just sit down and throw something together, but what you throw together may not necessarily be what you really wanted when you had the initial idea for the project. So taking that time, I think you're right. It's, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> it's definitely worth doing and uh, to get the project right. And obviously paid off really well for you guys. Um, so you mentioned motion capture a few times. What was your setup there? What suit do you have? Um, you know what? I can get it. One minute. Okay, yep, sure thing. So, 
you might want to cut this bit. There we go. So this is what I've got here. I actually already had one of these. Um, right. Just because I, I bought it. So like, like I mentioned before, I was planning on doing personal stuff. So yeah, you might not see. It might be a bit crushed actually because it's dark. Um, so this is a Rococo motion capture suit. Oh yeah. Um, so it's just you'll have seen like other creators and stuff using it. It's it's probably the best, uh, the best affordable. I say I say affordable in quotes because it's still expensive compared to the other kit I've got. It's like buying another computer. Um, <laughs> It's but affordable it's, compared to the, the stuff that costs like half a million dollars that you'd see in oh, a yeah. professional studio. Yes, it's, exactly. Um, it's it's very it's very affordable, uh, and the date you get out of it is actually for what it is and how much it costs. It's it's really really good. Um, so yeah, we we that's the mocap setup we use for that, and then for capturing face, it was literally a camera like this on my phone and video recording. And then using faceware to do that, right. and you can you can get faceware on a monthly license, so which is about I want to say about thirty quid, I think it were. Really um, yeah, and they had a free trial, so we just used the free trial because why not? Because <laughs> um, uh, you know we we wanted to learn it and stuff and test it, but we'll actually be using we'll definitely be using faceware for stuff in the future because it's really good. Um, it's like it's an industry standard tool. Um, and so yeah, we use that for the face and Maya for uh, processing it all. But yeah, that, that was our mocap setup. So it was literally um, a Rococo mocap suit in a room not dissimilar for this because I actually moved house shortly after it was finished. So right. Um, but yeah, it's it's quite a simple setup, really. And they're it's really easy to that, use. Yeah, it's impressive that you can um, basically act out a Star Wars scene in your house. And it, it's basically work. You, you pretend to be Star Wars, like you, like you would do as a kid, but it's work and you can just do it. And then you record it with your suit and then you get this fantastic result. But at the end, when you put it all together in Unreal. And... Oh, it's, it's, it's incredible, dude. It really is. Oh, another thing we have. Here's another part of my mock-up setup. Um, very important. It's a BB gun stock, um, right. which we use as a prop for guns. Um, the reason we took the rest of the weapon off is because it's the Rococo suit is sensitive to metal, so yeah. plastic. Um, and you get there's a bit of weight. It's quite like the stock's quite heavy as well. It's got a counterweight in it. So if you can get like a stick just full of sand, for example, or something like that, or just full of some sort of weight, then you can get that extra performance in there because you're actually having to basically the adding in the weight in the animation is done for you. Because you're actually having to work to move it, uh, rather that than just kind of sense. like a lightsaber. Um, but yeah, that's another little part of the mocap so yes, I think that's a really important um, tip there for anyone watching who wants to get into motion capture is to have the prop related to what your character is meant to be holding, so that you can mm. actually have that in the performance. Yeah, it, it doesn't even have to be you know bang on. Um, I we saw it there. That that does that doesn't look like a A two eighty or or STG or whatever it's based off of. But you um, still hold it, it in the same way. Yeah, as, as long as it's there for the for the it doesn't even have to be exactly the same. It's for the performance because no matter what, your um unless you've got a scan of yourself and your character in the engine is exactly the same height as you, you're gonna deal with scaling issues anyway when you retarget yeah. it. So it doesn't need to be bang on. It just seems to be good enough for the performance so for example if a character is holding like something like a hard drive then you can get away with just holding your phone um and things like that it's just kind of knowing that halfway there is is good enough and yeah um you still got you got to put the work in to clean it up anyway so you know so you can save yourself some effort in places so what's your um process for doing the motion capture cleanup um so we uh so we'll get the data through Rococo. Um so that that has its own software for inputting the data and cleaning it up. And then um from there we will export that out into Maya. And uh so Maya's as you probably know is just a it's just an industry standard tool from Autodesk for animation and actually a lot of other things. And quick note on that, 
it's got a massive price tag to it, but you can get an indie license for like 30 quid a month or something like that. And so it's actually, considering what it is, it's also very affordable now. That's um, good to know. Yeah, because I had the same issue. I was like, oh God, I can't afford Maya on my whole PC. <laughs> uh, no, they, they do. It's about 300 quid a year or something like that. Um, That's got, actually really good value. So. It's really good for what it is. And the amount, of, it's the full version as well, not the LT version, because um, Keithy, I'm going to mention next is we use a, um, a plugin called Red Nine Studio. And there's two versions of it there's a free one and there's a um, an actual larger, uh, I think it's called Pro Pack version, which right. is paid for. The free version is fine for what we need because it has all the basically the Pro Pack has all the batch tools in it and all the the bigger workflow tools, whereas the studio version has all the very basic stuff in it. Um, if I can summarize it in a couple of words, so we basically use that, and it's got a tool in it called an animation binder. And um, for anyone familiar with Human IK, is that's what you'd normally use to retarget animation. So you'd bring in a a character um, with with human. Yeah, so you bring in some mockup data, characterize it using human IK, then map that to another human IK rig, and that works well. There is a tool in there to retarget to a custom rig as well, but it's a bit, I found it very fiddly. Hmm. What the Red9 animation binder does is it make the setup is a bit, it's a bit tricky to get your head around when you first do it because it is a bit complicated and very tech anim y. Um, but once it's set up, um, it's really, really easy to do. So I had my retargeting scene set up so that I had a copy of the Rococo skeleton with no animation on it. And then that would human IK to, um, let's try things. So the, the way the animation binder works is you have a copy of the skeleton that your animation rig is driving. And that actually drives your animation rig rather than driving the skeleton. And you can use that to bake the animation onto your rig, um, which is really, really handy because you can do custom things like, for example, a toe roll or a bowl roll. So you can have like, you imagine like, a, I can't really do it. If you imagine like a foot, you can just have like toe lift and things like that as like a control much easier. Or, you know, you might have quadrupeds or something crazy like that with like a million legs and you want a mocap crawling along the floor sort of thing. Um, it's pretty, I've not tried it for that because... I've not tried to record my dog, but it would be quite <laughs> fun. Uh, <laughs> but so that's the way we had it used. So I would literally, once it's set up, I drag and drop my mocap into Maya and it's mapped onto my rig within two clicks. Um, and then from there, it's just animating on a custom rig as you would normally, you know, cleaning up the mocap data and that kind of thing. Um, and that's it. And then from there, you just get it into Unreal. Um, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit more involved than that. There's things that come up, but that's the gist of it. That sounds good, though. Uh, might have to look into that because uh, I use iClone for myself for the animation. Um, but what you just said about Maya makes it sound like uh, it's an intriguing piece of software to try out and uh, have a look at. Yeah, it's it's definitely great for because um, there are tools for it in Unreal, like they've you know they started introducing control rig and things like that. Yeah. I've not really had a i've not really put aside much time to use it uh but i have used it for the face and it feels a bit like compared to using maya i think maya feels a bit still a bit more mature uh compared to it like it feels like a more refined tool to use um we like compared to doing it in unreal but you know it's whatever whatever works for you at the end of the day is really what's you know if it works for you then that's what's best for you um in my opinion but, well, I think now listeners will be very interested in having another piece of software that they can look at and knowing that it's actually now quite affordable for people to try out just to learn and experiment with. Um, because like you said, Maya was extremely expensive uh, uh, whenever it was. Um, and it's obviously off-putting for people who just want to learn and um, have some fun and maybe maybe what they would take um, do a short story or something but they're doing it on their own budget at home as a hobby or whatever uh, you can't spend thousands of dollars on yeah, pieces of software it, which you're not even sure you're going to like yeah it's, it's all it's already an expensive an expensive hobby to begin with so yeah. um yeah adding, adding that on it it's not it's not very good no 
So um, what advice would you give for people wanting to learn to get started with Unreal? Um, what sort of resources should they look out for? Um, so the first, the first thing I'd say is figure out if there's something you have in mind to make, go with that, figure out how to make that. Um, so to, and then, um, from there, what I would, what I would do as a starting point is I, I would, don't, don't worry, I'm not going to plug cause I haven't, I haven't got one myself. <laughs> so don't worry. Uh, <laughs> um, what I would try and find is a decent getting started in unreal generally. Right. So, um, there's loads of websites out there. For example, years and years ago, I used Digital Tutors, which is now merged with Pluralsight. And there's also Skillshare and Linda, YouTube. ArtStation Learning is also really good now. Or it's probably always been really good. I've just never really used it until recently. Um, and just find something that's good for a getting started thing that covers everything quite generally. And then that'll give you a base understanding of what you're doing. And then um, if it's something specific you want to create, I guess what you can start doing there is just figure out what that takes. So for example, if you want to create a, in fact, probably the easiest way to tell you how I started learning how to use game engines in general. So I started on CryEngine years and years ago. Um, I did use Unreal for a bit, and, but I hadn't touched it for a while. But I seriously started doing stuff in game engines in CryEngine. And I started off creating a like and just a custom environment, which was like a, a spaceship hangar, a very small spaceship hangar. And that was just kind of my way of learning CryEngine. And then I built up and made a bigger one and kind of kit bashed it together and made a slightly bigger cinematic with a, a camera flying around it, some characters doing some things. And I just gradually gradually kind of built up the projects I was working on. Um so you could do something like that as well, where you just want to make one thing that's small and simple to get you started and then i guess just gradually build up to something bigger or something that you really have in mind that you want to do which is what i what i did that's just what i did when i first started doing it um and then the idea i originally wanted to do i i didn't do i ended up doing letters from vega but that, that was way cooler anyway so it's fine um <laughs> But that's all I'd say. And, and there's loads of courses on there. So just, like I said, just start off on a get started one that covers a bit of everything to get you an understanding of what everything does and, and like, a you know, kind of a top level. And then you'll be able to find things that are more specific to what you want to do. So if it's cinematics and you want to create your own things from start to finish, then you'll want to learn about, um, you want to learn about sequencer and how to create your own environments and how how that works you know how all that stuff works as well maybe a little bit of vfx um a little bit a little bit of lighting stuff as well and some rendering features as well will be really good in fact there's a channel called um william falsher who um his 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 stuff is really really good he does tutorials for unreal um a lot of it is centered around rendering um, from what I've seen. So that's really good for the rendering side of it as well. Um, when you come to do that, that's what I used to learn it, uh, learn how to render my stuff and the results are really, really good. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of it I'd say. So <laughs> in, in summary, go for a getting started guide, um, and just work, work through that. So it covers a bit of everything. And then if there's something you, you're specifically interested in, you can find a course or a video on it and just soak up as much info as you can and make your own stuff start small and then gradually work your way up and try and like, don't worry about the quality of it. Just get it, just get it done and anything you learn, apply it to the next one and then keep going. And there's multitudes of discord servers there's unreal slackers. And if you can think of a creator for cinematics, there's probably a discord server that they have as well. And they're full of people that will help you out as well. So don't be afraid to ask for help as well. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you a lot of editing work to do to make this very concise. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's all uh, really helpful. The real work is going to be, I'm going to track down these resources and put, again, links in the show notes. So anyone who wants to 
explore these can easily just click and find all these things yeah if you want a hand with that by the way just if you want to hand finding stuff just let me know and i can send you some things um, uh, please do yeah because uh, you know all these resources so uh, yeah we'll just, in the... yeah yeah, yeah just, just give me a list and it'll be fine um okay. but yeah so that's another thing just you know don't be afraid to ask for help um there's people the discord server's full of people that are just like you um that are doing this as a hobby find you know, and kind of learning how to do it themselves and they'll have come across the same problems you're coming across and if you ask them for help they will help you because chances are in the past they've asked someone for help and they help them and you, you end up with just these little there's little communities everywhere where um people are just helping each other and it's really cool really really cool to see um yeah that's that's how, that's how you get started i think that's good um yeah encouraging people to learn and develop their skills is something where we feel very strongly about so it's nice to know that communities out there that are all about that and helping each other uh, overcome the problems with the uh, whatever platform they're using and um uh, yeah we, we like it um so you mentioned a few times a film called uh they've slipped up my head now oh my god I'm a terrible journalist. Battlestar Galactica. No, no, that's it's um, so sure. your Vega film. Oh, Letters from Vega. That's so, that's it. I'm so sorry. Um, it's all right. I was thinking about all these tutorials, and the name just went out there over there. Uh, so <laughs> Letters from Vega. You've you mentioned this before, and I looked at it, and this is a film that's made with Star Citizen, and this is we've been looking at uh, Star Citizen videos for a while now, and we're really excited as a a way to create Machina as well because it's it's this big open world. And there's a lot of places to go to and some of the cinematic tools in it, like the, the way you can, the voice chat in the built in the game where you can talk and then it, it makes the character's face move. Um, yeah, that's like, cool, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so none of us have actually tried. I mean, I, I backed the game when it was uh, started funding, but I haven't actually tried it um, as a way to make cinema. Um, I haven't actually tried it recently because I, I keep waiting for more things to come out. But um, we're really excited as this is a machine platform. So you're the first person we've talked to who's actually made something with it. So what was that like as a as a way to, to make those videos? It's very similar to what I'm doing now. Well, it was very similar to what I'm doing now. Um, yeah. Where you basically... Um, so there are, like... So for example, in what I'm doing now, all the assets I have are extracted from Battlefront. And... At the time when I did it, there were tools to get the assets out of um, Star Citizen at the time and convert them and work with them and things. It was pretty. It was pretty much the same. Um, so uh, that was all built in CryEngine at the time, and with working from it, it was basically it was very similar to Un Unreal in how we approached it and how we used it. We didn't do any mocap for it. We used canned animations because I didn't know how to do mocap at the time. Right. And um, yeah, it was it, it was it was pretty it was pretty much the same. So that was actually my uh, I think Letters from Vega was my big project that I was building up to when I was first learning how to do this. Um, so I mentioned it before. Start with something small and build up. My journey was start with something small and make a little little hanger with a little gladius in it. Start with something bigger. I rip off Battlestar Galactica and build a bigger hangar with more Gladius and Gladius Gladii in it. And then I think it was after that I wrote the script for Letters from Vega. Same process I described earlier for Fallen Angel. And uh, got in touch with my friend Sean um, to help to help out with it. And yeah, just kind of we, we built it from there. It took us about a year uh, to make. Um, but yeah, it was a bit. It, it was it was the same process. It was just a, a bigger project because um, obviously the scope for it instead of three minutes, it was sixteen. It had space battles and well, it said it had hints of space battles. It had battles on the ground. We we're trying to make like a big airfield feel alive and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I think overall it was like actually working with it workflow wise was very similar to what we do. Well, what we did on Fallen Angel. Hmm. Good to know that, that your experience with, with that helped with Fallen Angel. Yeah, it's just the um, it's just the mindset of it. Um, 
where how you'd, how you'd approach it is very similar. Um, it's just a different, it's just different tools and slightly different ways of working with them. But yes, yeah, it's, it's quite similar. Okay. So um, obviously we really enjoyed Fallen Angel. And um, one of the questions that I think we'd all like to know is, are you working on something new? What's your, what's your next project? Can you talk about that yet? Or is it just a case of we have to wait and see? <laughs> um, so I mentioned that um, I did have another project that was scrapped for Fallen Angel. So I've been working on that on and off. And um, yeah, so I've been working on that on and off and working on it when I can. But, you know, with the holidays and stuff, I've just been meeting with family and doing all that stuff. Um, so that's kind of on there, but it's, it's one of those where I'm not that, to be honest, I'm not that inspired to get it done because a friend of mine recently reached out with a pitch for something else that he really wants to do. And I'm like, actually, that's really cool. So we're in the pre-production for that. Okay. So but obviously you can't talk about that just yet. I can't talk about that just yet. It's super, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. I'm <laughs> well, um, okay. What we have to do then is just keep an eye on your YouTube channel. Uh, and then I imagine when you're ready to reveal that project that we'll find it there. Yeah. Um, it, it will be a little while, a little while away yet. Um, but it will, it will be there. But what I am doing in the meantime is, um, I am actually creating tutorials for how I made Fallen Angel. So I'm basically taking little snippets from that of my workflow. And basically as I'm doing now, I'm just kind of doing a talking to camera piece, talking about what it is and the, the, the mentality behind it and then just showing you how I did it and stuff and really trying to make them high quality as well. So really putting in the time to edit them down and things like that to um, really, there's a tool for you actually, I didn't mention it before, DaVinci Resolve. Okay. Get that. If you want a decent video editor, it's free and it's fantastic. Um, it's, better, it's better than Premiere, in my opinion, and I've used both. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. This went on a lot longer than I thought it was going to. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a good time, man. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for joining me um, here today. Um, all the films and tutorials and things we've talked about, you'll find, uh, you'll find those in the show notes. Um, so see you uh, next time. Bye. And Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.